So I guess the first concept for us to talk through is this idea of natural history. Uh, and this is a very, very important consideration in both ruptured and unruptured uh, lesions. Uh, you know, in a variety of ways, we, we talk about this very broadly in neurosurgery for many, many diseases. And sometimes we don't necessarily refer to it the same way, but this is the idea of what happens to a given pathology if it's left uh, and just uh, studied over time. And so the question is, you know, which AVMs rupture? What are the things that cause AVMs to rupture? And over how much time uh, do those ruptures tend to happen, right? And this is the concept of understanding the natural history of these lesions. So a lot of our overall understanding of, let's say, rupture risk of an AVM, of an unruptured AVM, uh, has been from many, many pooled study data uh, over the last many decades. And this is just some more recent work that I've pulled here in this table that was published in Stroke 2017. And so, you know, these large, these four large pool studies uh, over a two-year window, and, you know, they have a variety of different study types, but in the end, without delving into too much detail, the takeaway point from this particular chart is that your annual risk of AVM rupture is somewhere around 1% to 2% if the AVM is unruptured, right? And so this is a very important number, I think, just for calculations uh, as, as we're balancing uh, treatment versus not treatment. And they're very important numbers, I think, for patients uh, to also understand. And it's, it's a nice, straightforward way of, of communicating with your patients in terms of lifetime risk of rupture. And if you look at the cat, uh, uh, categories here on the right, uh, this looks at ruptured AVMs, which is obviously outside of what we're discussing. But you, know, uh, you can appreciate the two studies that did look at this. Uh, theorize that there is a higher annual rupture risk uh, if the AVM has previously ruptured, uh, but there's a, some variation in that data. So let's just assume for the time being that our annual intracerebral hemorrhage rate at, for an unruptured AVM is on average about 2%. Two, 2%. So, you know, then the next question, as we talked about, is, you know, what are the impact of these high-risk features? So, what are the factors that can cause unruptured AVMs to bleed, right? That was what this study looked at, uh, again, in 2017. And this is a, a couple of a large pool studies, again, and you can see it's a heterogeneous uh, pool, and they looked at a variety of different endpoints, but you can highlight just some of these. And so, if you look, for example, at deep venous drainage, and I know you guys have probably talked about the idea that deep venous drainage is a higher risk feature. So based on this study by Gross and Dew, it probably at least doubles your potential risk of annual rupture risk. And similarly, if you look at perhaps associated aneurysms that we talked about, that also uh, pretty much doubles your annual rupture risk. Uh, and so these are clearly important things to know about your AVM before you make a decision on overall rupture risk of that particular lesion. So <clears throat> asking that question in a slightly different way, and that is that, okay, once you look at, once an AVM is actually ruptured, what are some of the common factors that we notice across all of these AVMs that we might be able to say uh, pre-rupture uh, might predispose to rupture, right? It's a slightly different way of kind of asking the same overall question. And so these are four studies, and these are spread over quite a broad period of time. But you can see in general, most of these studies concur that uh, in the lesions that ruptured, they were more common to have aneurysms. Uh, they were more common to have deep venous drainage. And single venous drainage, almost universally here, was associated with rupture. And I think the idea behind that last point is that, you know, if there are multiple veins and you have, let's say, outflow stenosis with one of those veins, um, there are other outlets at a lower pressure for the blood to get out, right? I think it's a simple way to at least look at it. If you have a single draining vein, it becomes extremely important real estate and any issues associated with that particular vein, whether it's a pressure abnormality or progressive enlargement, um, th there aren't too many other uh, stopgap measures in which that blood can get out, and that probably predisposes to that higher risk of rupture. So, you know, the next thing that I, I think is very important for us to communicate with our patients, because invariably they're going to ask you, is, you know, what, what is my rupture risk uh, over a lifetime, 
And this is something that I'm very particular about making sure that all my patients at least have some ballpark estimate to wrap their minds around as, as they're contemplating treatment with us. So I, I think some of the earliest work on this was done by Dr. Kanzi Loka. Um, and these are some very thorough actuarial tables, uh, in, in fact, created by Metropolitan Life Insurance Company that model risk of hemorrhage in AVMs. And so you can see the formula here. And if you look at the actuarial table, the way it's laid out is the agent initial presentation and estimate of risk gives you some idea of lifetime risk of rupture. And obviously you could see why an insurance company would wanna know this, but this is obviously clearly data that is important to us as uh, treating uh, cerebrovascular surgeons. So in general, if we're estimating a risk of 2% annually and your 15 years older presentation, then your annual, then your lifetime rupture risk is somewhere around 70%. But you know, if you're estimating a higher risk with perhaps a high risk feature, if you have an AVM with outflow stenosis and some aneurysms that maybe it increases your risk to 4% a year, then you probably can more confidently share with the patient and their family that perhaps your risk is closer to 90% lifetime risk. All right. So a more simplified formula that you know perhaps uh, you guys have seen in the past um, is uh, just 105 minus the patient patient's age. I think this is a much easier thing uh, for us to calculate on the fly as we're kind of running around the hospital or seeing patients quickly uh, in terms of uh, a ballpark idea of risk rupture. And this formula, though effective, does have some limitations that we just need to understand up front. Uh, it does assume a degree of population homogeneity. And we know obviously that there are many differences in the overall population, uh, country by country and even region by region. And so you can't assume that all population is the same, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, that's what it assumes. And then it also assumes uniform natural history that you know, if you've, if the last five years you haven't had a rupture that your overall risk for the next five years is the same. And I think most of us recognize having followed many patients, you know, perhaps for decades, that there probably is a re reduction in annual risk the longer you know that you've had this AVM. Now that reduction isn't particularly well classified, uh, but again, this formula does not assume that. So it probably does overestimate rupture risk um, on a whole. So the grading systems I know you guys have talked about, and that's the Spetzel Martin grading system. Um, you know, breaking AVMs into grade one through five based on size, location, deep venous drainage for a total score of anywhere from <clears throat> one to five. And we'll get to kind of how that score plays into um, our discussions about uh, management and counseling. But I think the important point to understand is that this AVM grading system developed by Dr. Spetzler and Martin was never designed as a prognostication system for natural history. It was designed as a complication assessment uh, at the time of surgical resection. And so you, we broadly apply it, but that wasn't the original intent. Everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.